Number 37. Serving at a speed of 170 kilometers per hour, a tennis player hits the ball at a height of 2.5 meters and an angle theta below the horizontal. The baseline is 11.9 meters from the net, which is 0.91 meters high. What is the angle theta such that the ball just crosses the net? All right, so let's just try to draw a uh, picture. All right, so we have a tennis player. And um, if that's not Roger Federer, I don't know what is. And there's the ball. And uh, he's going to be serving the ball. So let's draw a set of coordinates at the top. There we go. And there. Now the ball is going to have, it says, it's going to be um, struck with a, an initial speed of 170 kilometers per hour. And that vector will be below the horizontal. All right, so we have something that looks like this. What I'm gonna do actually, uh, instead of writing the 170 kilometers per hour here, I know I'm, uh, it's better off we just convert it into meters per second, uh, just because the acceleration will probably be dealing with gravity in the problem and that's in meters per second squared. So let's just take care of that right now. So 170 kilometers per hour, per one hour. Kilometers on the bottom to get, oh, kilometers on the bottom, meters on the top, 1,000 meters to one kilometer, kilometer goes away. Now I gotta get rid of hours in the denominator, so hours go in the numerator. Then minutes in the denominator, there's 60 minutes in an hour. Hours cancel. Now I gotta get rid of minutes, so that goes in the numerator, and then seconds in the, de in the uh, denominator, 60 seconds in a minute. And that's our conversion. So it's just 170 times 1,000 divided by essentially 3,600. So it's 72, uh, excuse me, 47.2. 47.2 meters per second, all right? So that's gonna be the value here. This is gonna be 47.2 meters. And actually, you know what? Let me write out that it is the initial velocity. 47.2 meters per second. Okay, great. So then there is a ground, right? There's a uh, ground to this problem. Okay, and there's a net a certain distance away, right? So let's draw in the net. Let's say the net is about right, I don't know, right here or so. And that distance, right, the height of the net, it tells us is 0 0.91 meters high. So let me write that over here. So 0 0.91 meters high. And the net from the baseline, let's say the baseline is right here where the ball is being served, right, this net right here, is a, uh, the baseline is a distance of 11.9 meters from the net. So right in here now, right, we have a distance of 11.9 meters. Okay, great. <clears throat> and uh, what else? Oh, and they also tell us that the height of the ball, right above the ground when it's being served, is uh, 2.5 meters, right? So this is 2.5 meters. Okay, so now, um, I think that's everything in the problem, right? Yes, it is. And what they're asking us to do is they're asking us to solve for this theta. Okay. So right now it almost sounds like we don't have enough information. Uh, we do, but we're going to have to do some substitutions and uh, we got to solve some equations for variables. It's a little complex, but uh, let, let's get to it. So basically the first thing is um, I'm first going to break up uh, this Initial, uh, initial velocity vector into uh, x and y components. Why am I going to do that? Well, I, they gave me a horizontal distance, right? And I can only uh, take this hor excuse me, horizontal distance into account if I find the x component of the initial velocity. And they also gave me some vertical components, right? The height of the net, they gave me the height of the ball. And uh, in terms of the initial velocity, I can only take the uh, y component, right? The initial velocity in the y direction into account when I account for those uh, heights. So let's first break that up into uh, its components. So we have an X component here, and let's uh, let's take that to be, uh, what would this be? This would be uh, VI X, the initial velocity in the X direction. We don't know what that is. And then we will take uh, this vector right here. Let me right, draw it a little straighter. That vector right there, uh, that will represent the initial uh, velocity in the y direction. Now just be careful here, this is gonna be negative, 
right? Because it's in the negative y direction, so we have to take that into account, all right? Whereas the x component is positive since it's in the positive x direction. All right, so now let's just create a formula uh, that solves for initial velocity in the x and initial velocity in the y direction, all right? So we're just using simple uh, trigonometry here. We know the hypotenuse of the triangle, we know this angle, and we're looking for the side adjacent to that angle, therefore I'm gonna use cosine. So cosine of theta is equal to the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. Cosine of theta is equal to the initial velocity in the x direction, right, divided by uh, 47.2. So the initial velocity in the x direction will equal 47.2 times cosine of that angle. Okay, that's all, that's all I can do there. Now let's do the same thing for the initial velocity in the y direction. Instead though, I'm gonna be using sine because that side is opposite of the angle. So now let's do sine of theta. Actually, I'm gonna move it over a little bit because I think I'm gonna need as much space as possible here. Sine of theta um, will equal the opposite side over the hypotenuse. So sine of that angle, which, we're, which we are calling theta, is equal to, now here's the thing, negative viy, why is it negative? Because it's in the down direction, um, over 47.2. Okay, so this means now that it would be, it would be negative viy, right? And then that would equal um, 47.2 times sine now of theta. Okay, great. Now just, right, I would divide this side out by minus one. I'm not gonna do the steps because I need the space. So let's just erase this little negative sign on the left-hand side and just bring it on over to the right. So that's negative. Okay, so we have these two, uh, these two equations here. Okay, great. Let me just box this one. All right. Now, um, so we got that out of the way. Now let's try to do something with this particular distance. All right, this is a horizontal distance, so therefore it's an x component, right? It's an x displacement. And now remember, in a free fall problem, because essentially once the ball is struck, it's a free fall problem, there are no accelerations in the x direction. Therefore, the velocity is constant the entire problem in the x direction. So um, that being the case, whatever initial velocity I found here will be the same velocity everywhere in the problem. All right. So I can say that velocity uh, will equal the displacement over time. Now specifically, it, right, I can plug in the initial velocity here because velocity in the x direction, again, is the same. So that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna do 47.2 cosine of theta, all right, will equal then 11.9 over t. All right, let's leave that alone, right? So now what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to incorporate, the, why did I do that? I'm just trying to incorporate more information into my formulas, all right? Uh, now, that's all that we can do for x, that's it. Now the only other thing we can do now for y, remember they, they, the other information they gave us was in terms of heights. So they gave us the height of the ball initially and they gave us the height of the net, right? So if we picture it, this ball is gonna travel, right, and then it's gonna come down at some angle like that. So we wanna make sure that the ball just passes the net there, okay? So if we think about this, if I, if I call this my initial state of conditions for the, um, uh, for the y calculation here, and this point my final state, okay, what do I know um, about these conditions, about these uh, uh, frames, about these states? Well, what's the displacement between the initial state and the final state here? How could you calculate that? Well, it's easy, right? If we were to think about how do we calculate uh, displacements, change in displacements, uh, we calculate it by doing this, right? Change in the displacement of y will equal the final value of y minus the initial value, right? Minus the initial height. Okay, so what is the final height if I call this point my final point? Well, that would be 0 0.91. And what's the initial? Well, if I call that my initial point, the initial height was 2.5. So 2.5, great. So now I can ch find a, my change in y value. So it's 0.91 minus 2.5, or negative 0.59, but we're gonna round to negative 1.6, and that's in meters. Okay, so that I found there. Now in terms of this frame, from the initial frame to that final frame, what's the uh, acceleration? 
Remember, we're talking about y, so therefore it is gravity, negative 9.80 meters per second squared. All right, do we know the final velocity in the y direction? Uh, no, right? Will it be same as the, in, as the initial y velocity? Uh, no, because it's falling, right? So since there's an acceleration in the y direction, that, that velocity should be changing. So it won't be the same as the initial. It'll be different. Remember, we already found a formula for the initial. Okay, and now the only thing that I don't know about this is time, correct? But here's the thing. Time is a little special, right? Um, the reason being is because time is component-less, meaning time, there's no component to, to it. There's no such thing as x time or y time. It's just time, right? Time knows no boundaries. It knows no difference between the x and y coordinates. And therefore, time is an important variable in these problems that allow you to connect x frames or x components with y components. Okay? You can't do that with the other variables because they're all in different um, uh, dimensions, right? They're all in, one is in an x dimension, one's in the y dimension. So time, though, knows no dimension. So what I want to do here actually now at this particular point is I realize I created a formula here that has time in it. Now I'm thinking to myself, well, wait a minute, if I can now create a formula with all of these givens and knowns and unknowns with time in it, maybe I can start substituting things, right? And maybe that'll get me somewhere, all right? Because I definitely don't have enough information right now in terms of these formulas to solve. I got to do a whole bunch of substitutions. So what do we need to do? Well, I need to use the displacement, right? The displacement of y because that's additional information that they gave me in the problem. I need to use acceleration. And I also want to, remember, the whole goal is to try to solve for theta here. All right, so maybe I want to include a formula with my initial velocity in the y direction. All right, and maybe also then time. I definitely want time in it because then I can connect these two equations together. So which one are we going to choose? It sounds like number two on the upper right-hand corner fits the bill here. So when I do that, let's see what happens. So what I'm going to do is um, let's write now change in y, right, is equal to the initial velocity in the y direction times time plus one half of the acceleration in the y direction times time squared. So the displacement or the change in y, right, was negative 1.6. The initial velocity in the y direction is what we found over here, right? So that's going to be negative 40. 7.2 sine of theta, okay, times time, plus one half times the acceleration in the y, which is negative 9.80, times time squared. All right, great. Let's just clean this up slightly. Not really too much to clean up here, but let's uh, just combine these terms essentially. So we got negative 1.6 is equal to negative 47.2 sine Oops, sine theta times t plus, now half times negative 9.8 is going to be uh, negative, so actually let me just get rid of the plus sign, negative 4.9t 4. 4. squared. Okay, now what do we want to do? Well, now look what we have, guys. We have this equation that has two unknowns, meaning theta and time, and now I just created another equation that has two unknowns, also theta and time. Well, that's wonderful, right? Because now I realize I have two equations with two unknowns. Uh, that, that's a solving system of equations now, meaning that all I have to do now is solve one of them for, let's say, time, and then plug it into the other equation. And now I'm going to start to get an equation then with only one variable. And that's what we like, because if we have an equation with only one variable, we can solve it. We can solve that. All right, so let's now take this equation right here and let's solve it for time. Basically, just switch the numerator and the denominator. Okay, it's a little math trick. So time will be equal to 11.9 over 47.2 cosine of theta. Now what I'm going to do is, since this is equal to time, and the time in the x frame is the exact same thing as time in the y frame, doesn't matter, okay, 
And also remember, well, not only are they the same time, but they're, we're talking about the same points, right? Because my X dimension, uh, my X dimension, my displacement in the X was 11.9. Notice how that distance correlates with this being the initial point, which is essentially at this on the same plane as the uh, initial point for Y. And then it talks about this being the final point, which is also the final um, dimension for uh, Y that I chose. So that's why we can do this. All right, so let's take this, thread the needle here, and now what we're gonna do is just plug it in for time here and time here, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite it at the top. All right, so let me erase this conversion stuff. All right, that's not really important anymore. And let's try to see what we can write on the top now. So my formula is gonna become now negative, well, let me give myself some room. Uh, right here should be good. Negative 1.6 is equal to negative 47.2 sine of theta times time, but instead of time, I'm gonna plug in the 11.9 divided by, right, 47.2. So now it's gonna be 11.9 over, oh, I don't think, I didn't get myself enough room at all here. Sorry guys, just give me one second, apologize. All right, let me back it up. So negative 1.6 is equal to negative 47.2 sine of theta multiplied by time, but now I'm gonna plug in the 11.9 over the 47.2 cosine theta, okay? Minus now 4.9 times the time value squared. So it's 11.9 over 47.2 cosine theta and that whole thing is squared. Oh my goodness, right? All right, so let's see what we can do here. Let's clean some things up. So if I notice already, I can cancel this 47.2 with this 47.2, right? So let's do that. So we got negative 1.6 is equal to now negative sine, uh, let me put the number first, negative 11.9 sine of theta over cosine of theta. Okay. That, and now minus, so let's do, let's do the math here. So let's do 11.9. So let's do 11.9 divided by 47.2. And we get 0 0.252, all right? So we get negative 4, 4.9 times, now it's gonna be negative 252, negative, well, it's not negative, what am I talking about? 0 0.252, all over now cosine of theta. And that's going to be squared. Okay, now what I want to do here, I want you to notice something, guys. Look at this, sine theta over cosine theta. Do you remember what that is equal to? If you remember back to trig, well, that is equal to tangent. Okay, so I'm going to write that over here. So tan of theta is equal to the sine of theta over the cosine of theta. All right, we're going to have to use that. All right, this problem is very tough. We're gonna to need a couple of trig identities. I added some to the table, no, some to the page on the right-hand side to begin with. Right, but I wanted to see if you guys remembered that one. Because that one you should. The other ones are a little, not less common, but usually, usually they're not utilized as much. So negative 11.9, instead of writing sine theta over cosine theta, now I'm gonna write tan theta. Okay, minus now. So let me do some math here. All right, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to square Basically, I'm gonna distribute the square to the numerator and the denominator, okay? I'm gonna do a, so let me take the numerator here and square it, all right? So it'd be 0.252 squared. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that value and multiply it by the 4.9. And I get negative uh, 0 0.311, and now that's over cosine theta squared. All right, let me make that square a little bigger, squared, okay? All right, now we're good, we have one unknown, but we have two trigonometric functions. So now what I'm thinking about is how the heck do I get rid of either tangent or cosine squared? Well, I wanna make them all have the same function. So notice this handy, well, not handy yet. Let's, the other one's a little more handy, but. The, this one will get us there. So notice that cosine, one over cosine is the same thing as secant. And this item here basically can be broken down into um, 0 
one one times one over cosine squared theta, right? That's the same thing. So what I can do here is pretend that this piece is the same as secant because I know this relationship, all right? But now, well, it's not the same as secant, it's the same as secant squared, right? So really what I can do is alter this and say one over cosine squared is the same as secant squared, all right? So that's what I'm gonna do here. So let me just backtrack. Okay, I'm just gonna put a little squared sign up there. It's still valid, all right? So now let's see what we come up with here. So we've got negative 1.6 is equal to negative 11.9 tan theta minus now 0 0.311 secant squared theta. Now, why did I do that? I did that because I want to use this second one now. Look at this, secant squared theta is now equal to tangent squared plus one. That's great, now I can finally get one equation with one unknown and one trig function. Thank God. All right, so now this is negative 11.9 tan of theta minus 0 0.311 times tan squared theta plus one. Okay, now all I wanna do is just do a distribution here and now we're gonna start setting this thing up, all right? I'm just gonna do the distribution and let me do that uh, let me do that over here. I think I might be able to fit it. So let's see. So now we're going to have negative 1.6 is equal to negative uh, 11.9 tan theta, tan theta, and minus now, well, I'm going to run close, minus 0 0.311 tan squared theta, right? Plot minus, let me just draw a little line here. Sorry guys. Okay, that looks good. Minus then, uh, hold on one second. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm do a little magic here, watch. There we go. Now I have enough room. Okay. So um, then that's going to be, and let me just erase that little piece right there. So now we have, let me just make sure. So now we're gonna have then minus, because it's a negative 0 0.311 times one minus 0 0.311. All right, perfect. So now what do we have here? Well, now I have almost what looks like a quadratic, right? I got a squared term, I got a singular term, and then it looks like I got some constants. So what I wanna do is I wanna try to put this into quadratic form. I always like having positive coefficients, by the way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add this term, right, over to the left. I'm also going to then add this term on over to the left. And same thing here, I'm gonna add this thing on over to the left and combine it with its like term right there. All right, so now when I rework this, it should work out to be negative 0 0.311 tan squared theta plus 11.9 tan theta. Now we just have to do some math, so it's a negative 1.6 plus, oh, negative 1.6 plus 0.311. So we get a negative, let me just make sure I did that. Yep, negative 1.29, 1.29. And that is all equal to zero. So now here is the quadratic, basically. You might say, well, wait a minute, where's the x? I got tan squared, what is going on? No, 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 this is the x. This whole thing is like x, all right? So watch, this is my, oh, I made a mistake. I just see it. So many things going on, I made a mistake. I know a lot of you are probably yelling at me right now, but there, that, that was the mistake, right? I had a minus sign right here, guys. I just erased it, all right? That should not have been a minus sign. It should have been a plus sign. So I'm always constantly trying to check the work as I'm looking, and I, eh, at least I caught it. So uh, this now has the form. Let me change the color. This now has the form of... A, this is my x now, tan theta is the x, and that's squared. Then this value right here is my b, and that's my x, and this is c, okay? So here's the a, here's the b, and it's, there's the c. So now you can use your quadratic formula, right, that um, x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. I'm not gonna do that, you can do that, but I'm just gonna plug it into my calculator at this point, all right? 
So just know that the um, that my A value here is 0 0.311. My B value here, just so we're clear, is 11.9. And my C value here is negative 1.29. All right. So when I now use those values, let's see what I get. So let me go to the calculator program. You can also graph the thing and then figure out where it, it intersects the uh, x-axis. That's fine too. 0 0.311 is the A. 11.9 is the B, and C is negative 1.29. Okay. All right, so I get two values. You can basically reject the negative value. That's not going to be important, all right? So what we have here is, so let me write this. So now I have, I found that X is equal to, so X will be equal to uh, 0 0.108. Now remember, that was x, okay? But what did my x represent in the problem? Well, my x here represented tan of theta, right? So I can't really just write x here. I got to really, really write tan theta is equal to 0 0.108. Now, how do you solve for theta? Just do the inverse tangent. Oh my goodness, finally, hopefully we, re hopefully we reach the promised land. Let's see, second tan of 0.108. Ah, that looks pretty good to me. Looks pretty much on point. So now the theta value here is going to be uh, 6.16. All right, so 6.16 degrees. Oh, all right. Man, that's a long problem and a hard problem, but we got there. Now, I think I may have added one significant figure in here. So maybe the answer should be 6.2 degrees technically, but at this point, who cares? All right, so we got that. So we know our theta value now is 6.16 degrees. Now, what are we gonna do? All right, so we found that. Now it asks us, will the ball land in the service box whose service line is 6.40 meters from the net? So basically what they're telling us is this, that there's a service box here, if you're familiar with tennis, right? There's a little service box that you gotta serve the ball into, all right? And they say that its uh, distance from the net is going to be, let me make it a little straighter. Its distance from the net is going to be, why didn't that come out straighter? There we go. Its distance from the net is going to be 6.4 meters. So this little piece right here is gonna be 6.40 meters. Okay, so we have to figure out well whether it will land in the box or not. So the first thing is what I want to do. Um, remember, we, all we found was the angle. We never really found the initial velocities yet in the x and the y frame, and we're going to need that in order to calculate our answer. So please bring your attention down to the bottom left of the page. Here are my formulas, right, that I used before. Um, I didn't actually have a value for the initial velocity of x, but guess what I have now? I have my theta. So now I can go and plug it in, right, and find and find the answer. So the initial velocity in the x direction is going to be, so simply do 47.2 times the cosine of the angle we found, 6.16 degrees. And that works out to be 46.9, right? So we get a value of 46.9 meters per second. That's the x, initial x velocity. Why don't we do the same for y since we're right here? So the same thing for y now, right next to it. Simply take negative 47.2 times the sine now of 6.16. And we get a value of negative 5.06. So negative 5.06. All right. And that should make sense because it's in the negative y direction. So we're good here. All right. So now... How do I figure this out, whether it's going to land in the box or not? Well, the important thing here is I need to know the time. I got to figure out the time the ball's in the air, all right, in order for me to answer the question. So what I want to do is calculate the time ball is, eh, my writing is terrible, ball is in the air. Okay, now how do we do that? Well, it's easiest to do this if we, um, let me think about this actually. Well, we could do it either way. Um, no, 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 actually, no, no, I have to do it in terms of the y direction, all right, because it's in, it's in free fall, acceleration's pulling down on it, 
So uh, we're going to be able to figure out uh, the time from uh, the y direction. All right, so let's, li let's list the things we know. We know that the initial velocity in the y direction is going to be negative 5.06. Okay, we also, we don't know the final velocity in the y direction, right? We don't know the velocity which it will hit the ground with. We do know the acceleration though, and the acceleration should be negative 9.80 meters per second. We also know the total height that the ball, or the, right, the, the ball will travel. The total height the ball is going to travel when it hits the ground, right, is going to be 2.5 meters. Because essentially my frame now, the initial frame is still here, but I shifted now my final frame to the end. So the height differential now is negative 2.5. Why is it negative? Because it's going, starting high and ending low. So it's traveling in the negative y direction. So now I should have enough I need in order to calculate my time. Okay, so uh, yeah, let's do that. Okay, so now what we need to do is, mm, what formula, sorry, I just got distracted. We have to select a particular formula to use here. And it seems like we're going to be using, mm, yeah, we're gonna be using number two again, okay? So I think we're gonna have another quadratic, but we're gonna do that quickly, all right? so. Uh, Change in y is equal to the initial velocity in the y direction times time plus one half the acceleration in the y times time squared. So this was negative 2.5. That is equal to um, negative 5.06 t. Now half times a y, I'm just gonna, because I'm running out of space, it's going to be then minus, minus 4.9, right, t squared. So let's just bring everything on over to the left-hand side to make the coefficients positive. So now it should be 4.9 t squared plus 5.06 t minus 2.5 is equal to zero. So there's your, here's your a, here's your b, here's your c. And now you can plug it into the quadratic again. I'm just going to solve now um, using the program here in my calculator. So the a value is 4.9, the b value is 5.06. The C value is negative 2.5. So we get a uh, time value, ignore the negative time. We don't have negative time here. So now it's gonna be 0 0.365, 365 seconds. That's how long the ball will be in the air. Okay, now what do we wanna do? Well, we wanna see whether the ball will now travel, so bring your attention to the picture. We wanna see whether how far in the X direction the ball will travel. If the ball travels in 0.365 seconds, if it travels longer than this service line, meaning if it goes over here, well, bad serve. But if it is shorter, if it lands here, let's say, if it's shorter than this distance, then we know it's gonna be good. We know it's definitely gonna go over the net because that's what we did over here, right? That's the craziness we did over there. So we're good, all right? So let's try to figure that out. So let's figure out how far the ball goes in the X direction with this time. How do we do that? Well, remember, we already have this particular formula, right? We know this formula, V is equal to X over T, okay? So we, so let me write this here. The average velocity in the X direction should be equal to the X displacement over the time. So what is the average velocity in the X direction? Well, it's never gonna change. It's always gonna be the bottom left-hand corner, 46.9 meters per second. So this is 46.9, Okay, 46.9 is equal to then x, because I'm gonna solve for the displacement. I know the total distance here, but what I wanna do is I wanna see how far it will travel given the time that it will be in the air, 365. So now when I just do a simple cross multiplication here, I get uh, 46.9 times 0.365. So we get a value of 17.1. So this is 17.1 meters, all right? That's how far the ball will actually travel. This is the actual, actual range, okay? But what's the maximum range that it could have traveled? Remember, it's it, from the point of the ball's release, it had to have traveled 11.9 meters to the net, and then it was allowed to travel a maximum of 6.4 more meters right until the end of that service line. If it traveled more than that, it's no good. If it traveled less than that, it's good. So let's calculate the maximum, okay? So this should be easy, so I'll call it x max. 
x max, x max should be then 17 point, oh, not 7, 11.9 plus then the 6.4. And what do we get there? So 11.9 plus 6.4, and we get 18.3, 18.3 meters. This is the maximum, and this is what will actually happen. So since it travels less than the maximum, the serve is good. An ace by Mr. Federer himself. Guys, thank you for tuning in. Hard problem, long problem, not impossible. But um, hopefully you learned a couple of things here, thinking about trigonometric functions, remembering all those trig identities. All right, starting to set up the equations at the beginning, even if you're uh, not sure of what to solve. Remember, just start creating equations and start thinking about how can I connect these two frames together? Oh, time was the key and this and that. All right, so thank you guys for tuning in and I hope to see you soon. Please subscribe and um, until next time.